Over the next three weeks, the routines and patterns that helped preserve our community, for the most part, fell back into place. The day after Isaac was apprehended, the curfew was lifted, as the attacks, well, the real ones at least, appeared to be the product of a bored teen. There was nothing else to fear. However, due to its semi-viral nature, the fallout of Isaac's rampage came soon after in the form of several sporadic, unrelated claims of citing the crazed entity, as well as more subsequent attacks, which were either largely unregarded or deemed as poor attempts of people desperately trying to get themselves on television. Although the majority of Arab was trying to invalidate everything associated with the Night Stalker, I was caught in the middle of a fury of several parties that kept pulling me back into the situation, no matter how hard I tried to forget it. My school held an organized rally in the gym. The guidance counselor came out and spoke to all of us, telling us that everything was okay and offered us resources if we wanted to talk about having a knife-wielding psychopath in our hallways. The theater program was much less forgiving. I can vividly recall the lectures in class, at rehearsals, saying how what Isaac did was an embarrassment to the program, and anyone else possibly involved in all of this was inherently responsible for the program getting threatened with shutdown. Our delinquency had destroyed the theater's reputation, and also those of the students that comprised it. The repercussions of that night affected my circle of friends as well. While I remained primarily unharmed from the decisions that I had made, I saw my once stable friend group fracture. Cameron was grounded heavily because of his heavy appearance in the sighting video with Grant, which everyone in town had seen by morning. And as a consequence, I hardly saw him outside of school. And even when we were forced to interact, he remained distant as if he were ashamed by his betrayal by association. Grant, similarly, started conjuring up excuses as to why he couldn't be around the rest of us outside of rehearsal. I stayed quiet, as did everyone else, and so I slipped by without retribution. However, after Grant, one by one, everyone else gradually followed suit. Caroline declared outright that she wanted no part in having anything to do with the Night Stalker anymore and as a consequence, personally removed herself from our friend group. Elizabeth likewise found idle things to keep her preoccupied, to hide her guilt. It broke my heart to see firsthand what I had caused her and the rest of them. I was a victim. Yes, a victim of misperception. From my narrow point of view, I saw what I was doing as harmless and did not take into account the reasonings of others. Riley Grace was entirely justified in all of her tirades, but my skewed approach to the situation prompted me to villainize her and her beliefs in favor of Isaac's. This had consequently allowed that hellish persona to manifest itself. Isaac. There was a lot more to him than he was telling us. Apparently his fascination with his character stemmed from years ago. He had frequented doctors and psychiatrists secretly to treat his delusional disorder. Isaac had been diagnosed with grandiose delusions at a young age, and as a consequence possessed an overinflated sense of power, of identity. The local news had found and leaked his medical records along with anything potentially damning a couple days after he was caught, which is where I first heard about all of this. I felt just as disconnected from Isaac as he had been from himself. I also heard through the inner workings of a small town judicial system, as well as his father pulling some strings down at the police station, Isaac's punishment had been largely reduced, and he was now just serving his sentence under house arrest, with the addition of increased semi-frequent psychiatric evaluations. I had indeed created a monster, but not just in the physical sense. Yes, from my mind, I had spawned a creature veiled by night that terrorized those I called neighbors and friends. But with that came the more vile entity called Betrayal, which single-handedly tore my friends and I apart, and I was left to pick up the fragments. Late one night, after tensions had fizzled out enough, I decided to approach Elizabeth to hopefully make amends for what I'd roped her into. I sat staring out of my bedroom window, almost falling into a trance listening to the steady patter of rain against my windowsill. However, it didn't deter me from my mission. 
I focused on the litter tossing itself in the wind, passing the cars parked along the one-way street, and anything else that could distract me from what I was about to endure. I dialed her number, and after five drawn-out rings, I heard a click on the other end, followed by a heavy sigh. What do you want? She spoke sharply. I just want to talk, I stammered, sounding weaker than I had intended. Well, you could have done that anywhere. Elizabeth spoke with an inflection equivalent to rolling her eyes. I tried, but look, everyone's mad at each other and nobody's listening. I want to make things right again. Can you please just go away? She groaned. I'm not in the mood to talk about this. I was confused a bit by the way she phrased that last sentence, but I continued. What are you talking about? I'm not answering the door, so just stop knocking. You know I'm home alone tonight, and it's really starting to freak me out. My body turned rigid at those words. I took a step back from what she had just said. Elizabeth, I have no idea what you mean. I'm in my room. She paid no attention to my shaking voice and just continued her short rant. I just saw you from my window. You think this is so funny to show up in that stupid clown mask? I thought you wanted all this to stop. I was suddenly overrun with an unmatchable terror. Elizabeth, that's not me, I pleaded. Then who is it? Grant? Cameron? Only you guys would be such assholes. Suddenly I heard glass shatter in the background, and Elizabeth let out a high-pitched shriek. I'm calling the police! Elizabeth hung up quickly. My mind started racing. There was physically no way Cameron was responsible. Knowing his parents, they wouldn't let him out of their sight. And Grant wasn't the type for revenge. However, there was still another possibility. My body surged with a sense of vitality and I sprung up, throwing on my coat. If I was correct about what was actually happening, I had no time to waste. The police would take forever to respond to a call from a girl home alone hearing spooky noises that might as well have been a raccoon. But I feared Elizabeth was in real imminent danger. I rushed out my front door without explanation hopped into my car, and sped in the direction of her house. As my headlights carved a path out of the darkness in front of me, I dialed Grant. He answered, sounding confused as to why I was calling him. Dude, what are you doing right now? I spoke, almost out of breath. Um, I'm sitting in my room. Why? He groaned. Something's happened to Elizabeth. I continued the conversation while only half paying attention to the road ahead. Wait, what? Grant sounded concerned. I don't know exactly, but I'm headed over there now, I said as I turned onto the highway. Oh my god. Uh, give me a minute and I'll come with you, Grant said, and I could hear him scrambling around his room. No, no, I need to go now, I insisted. I don't want anybody else getting involved in this. Please, just don't tell anybody about this. It was entirely the fault of a petty crush that she became a part of this in the first place. Now I wasn't about to let her or anybody else get hurt because of me. Suddenly, my mind lit up, and I grabbed Grant's attention. But I do need you to do something. Yeah, anything. What? I need you to check on Isaac, I spoke, unsure of what his reaction would be. Isaac? Is this him? I, I don't know. Just call him. Do whatever. Let me know when you hear from him. I hung up quickly and floored the accelerator as I flew down the street towards Elizabeth's house. After about 15 minutes in navigating the town's narrow back roads, I turned down our driveway, and I suddenly felt transported to an entirely different realm. I looked up at the sky to see a vast expanse of inky black. The moon was absent, and the only light that shone down on me came from a few scattered stars penetrating the layers of dark gray clouds. The storm clouds were accumulating, the downpour ever increasing. I swerved into the grass and threw my door open, making quick pace towards the front door. I banged repeatedly on the chipping wood, but got no response. Elizabeth? Elizabeth, it's Noah. Let me in, I shouted. Are you okay? I stood there for another minute, but then decided to shift my focus towards the backyard. If she wasn't going to listen to me, I was still going to solve the problem on my own. I traversed the backyard with extreme caution, and after I was reassured I was alone, I continued my sweep. I hesitantly dialed Isaac's number, hoping to confirm my hunch that it was him doing this. The dial tone left me with a bizarre sense of comfort in this otherwise desolate place. 
I listened closely for the accompanying rings from his phone, most likely somewhere close by in the woods. Yet I was met with the same still silence. After seven more rings, I was greeted by Isaac's voice mailbox, which caused me to pocket my phone in frustration. As I did so, I spotted a clump of something bright near the edge of the fire pit in front of me. It took shape as I approached it, and I could clearly see it was a patch of fiery orange hair. Suddenly the snapping of a deep twig in the forest jolted me up. I felt lured to the source despite everything inside of me telling me to retreat. Another crunch. I traversed the boundary from the backyard into the deep black maze of trees. The deeper I trekked, the more brittle and jagged the branches became. Crumpled brown leaves blanketed the forest floor, leaving the trees bare and completely void of life. Another crunch. I turned to my right towards the source, and I could just barely make out the tall, black mass standing a few dozen feet in front of me. The dense tree canopy above me prevented even a sliver of light from piercing it, leaving the mass encased in a protective shadow veil. Isaac, what the hell are you doing? I yelled, once again hoping to confirm my waning hunch. However, this mass paid me no mind. Isaac! The mass began walking away from me, and moments later disappeared into the camouflage of night. I pursued the mass that I presumed to be Isaac further into the woods, eventually coming up on him again once I rounded a large tree trunk. I yanked out my phone and shined my light onto him, and my jaw dropped, sending me into a state of shock. The figure was indeed wearing that awful clown mask, but his stature was too broad to be Isaac's. The man standing in front of me possessed heavy, wide shoulders and was hunched over as if he were heaving. His frame was almost familiar in a bizarre way. I stood there frozen, partially on my own accord as I tried to tie it back to something. But then it clicked. The man I saw before me was the same man I'd seen and presumed to be Maggie's father that night in her backyard. Even though I could not see his eyes, his gaze instilled in me a sense of unease, the same I'd felt at the bonfire. In Elizabeth's driveway, it made so much sense. The tapping on my window, Riley Grace's strange comments the night Isaac was caught, Isaac's obliviousness through it all. In an instant, my mustard prowess was stripped from me, as most everything I had come to believe over the past few weeks was suddenly invalidated. We were wrong to pin all of those crimes on Isaac, when in reality the thing standing in front of me had been on at least two accounts, responsible for two violent attacks against the town under the presumed anonymity of the Night Stalker, and had been given free reign to do so after we had ousted Isaac for the crimes he had truly been innocent of. My mind returned to reality for a moment to register that the mysterious man in front of me had turned back around and was running full speed in my direction. Without another thought, I broke off into a sprint deeper into the woods. The constant rhythm of crunching leaves against the pattering rain pushed me forward as I bobbed in between the piercing jags of the trees. The air smelt of rust and hot sweat the further I went. I kept my pace for nearly two minutes without shaking my pursuer. His footfall seemed to resonate against the trees, creating an echoing effect that made it seem as though I was surrounded by dozens of identical masked chasers. Without any illumination to guide my escape, I quickly became disoriented and was no better than a rat stuck in a maze. However, I could soon make out the growing drone of a coursing water in the distance, and my mind was suddenly flooded with memories of the days spent with Elizabeth building makeshift forts near that creek. From memory, the creek was too wide enough to jump across, especially in its current flooded state, but somewhere along that stretch should have been a bridge, one that Elizabeth and I had dedicated several weeks to building back in the first grade, that I could use as a secret escape, preventing the man in the mask from chasing me any further. I sprinted upstream, taking no time to wipe the torrential downpour from my face. Far ahead of me, I could make out the rough outline of a bridge constructed from twine and rotting tree branches. I entered the last stretch of my escape, throwing every obstacle I could behind me, including loose rocks and twigs to hopefully deter the Night Stalker long enough. I reached the edge of the footbridge and, without a second of time to debate, I leaped across it as far as I could. I was able to propel myself a little over halfway to the other side before I fell back onto the stacked twigs causing some to snap in half and slipping on the others, which almost sent me tumbling down into the rapids below. Holding on by one leg and two slipping hands, I climbed back up slowly, pulling my right leg out of the frigid water. 
and scrambled across the rest of the way on all fours. Once I was on stable ground again, I rose to my feet and bolted in the direction away from the creek. My lungs filled with a frosty thin air as I hurled myself over a fallen tree trunk and slid down a steep hill into a muddy, narrow ditch. I curled into a ball and waited with bated breath for what must have been at least 15 minutes for the night stalkers rustling to reemerge. But fortunately, I only heard the gentle yet forceful churning of the creek and the easing patter of the raindrops. I shattered the enveloping darkness by unlocking my phone, unleashing its blinding glow. I hoped for good news, but only saw a list of three missed calls from Grant, followed by two messages. Call me as soon as you can. Answer your phone. Followed by another string of missed calls and an unusually chilling message. I found Isaac. That last message prompted me to immediately call Grant, more desperate to hear a familiar voice than anything else. After only one ring, Grant picked up, breathing irregularly as if he were holding himself back from crying. No, where are you? I'm still at Elizabeth's. What happened? I, I drove over to Isaac's house and saw his car was crashed in a ditch. He must have been trying to break house arrest or something. I, I don't know why. Oh my god. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Yeah, I, I called 911 and now there's like six police officers and an ambulance in the driveway. He, he looks beat up pretty bad. Like, really, really bad. This wasn't a coincidence. Grant, if you can... Check the back seat or the trunk to see if you see anything. Okay, just give me a minute. It's really weird, like, how could you even crash this bad right in front of your own house? He didn't crash, and I knew without a doubt the reason it happened. Someone wanted that mask. The mysterious man's last piece of the puzzle before he could fully assume his new identity. I can only assume that's why he'd gone after Isaac in the first place. I presume Isaac had either intended to fight off or chase down the person who put him through all this hell, but through one way or another, still lost in the end. Okay, Grant, I'm gonna need you to just go home, lock your doors, and stay inside until morning. What? What's going on? What don't I know about? I couldn't bring myself to tell him the truth, whether that was out of my permeating self-doubt of the whole situation, or I still feared I'd be putting him in more danger. I'll explain later, just please do this for me, right now. I could hear him sigh deeply on the other end, desperate for answers. I hung up before he could protest, and I began my trek out of the woods. I took extra caution with each step I took, making sure my whereabouts remained hidden from any lurking figures, animal or otherwise. After another half hour, I reached the edge of the woods, which gave me the confidence to pick up my pace to a light jog. I nearly rounded the side of the house without a second glance, but I forced myself to check on Elizabeth again. I approached her back door and knocked gently twice. Thirty seconds passed and I knocked again, more forcefully, but again I heard nothing, not even a shuffling from inside. I decided it was best to leave it at that and just reassure myself that she was safe inside and I would talk to her sometime later. I plopped into my car, soaking wet and dripping clumps of mud, but I could only concentrate on the gravel shooting out from underneath my tires as I sped home. My mind jumped back and forth between that night at Maggie's, Isaac's arrest, and the sighting video. Whoever was truly behind all of this, if we had given them everything they needed, the name, the mark, the look, every step of the way, we had given them easy access to it all, and had inadvertently opened ourselves up to his wrath. The rest of that night remains only as a blur. The trauma I endured that night forces me to only remember scattered points in time. I can remember coming home to my parents to see them as furious as they were confused to my sudden departure. I explained everything down to the mud on my sneakers away by stating that Isaac needed help getting his car out of a ditch. I can also remember laying in bed that night, making a pact to myself that come tomorrow, I would come clean about everything. Hopefully then Isaac would be acquitted of the blame, and maybe the police would have enough information to find and convict this mysterious man. However, my hope slowly started to fray as days progressed, starting when Elizabeth stopped showing up to school. Her parents returned home a few days after that night, only to discover their daughter missing. 
and a pentagram scrawled in mud on their living room floor. I still came forward to the police, telling them everything that had happened that night and everything else, hoping that would lead somewhere. But then days passed, and we went weeks without hearing another word. Neither Elizabeth nor the real Night Stalker were ever seen again. The next solid memory I have comes from Elizabeth's funeral. It was, in a way, the final nail in the coffin, as some people like to joke, on the issue of whether she was alive or not. It signified that the town had wholly given up on finding her, yet they still felt she deserved a proper farewell from this world. I understood the sentiment, but I tried everything in my power to avoid going. I didn't want to come to grips with the fact that I wasn't able to save her that night. That me dragging her into this was the sole reason for her disappearance. With enough convincing for the rest of my friends, though, I came around. It was an unusual experience. It was good to see everybody together on the same side again. I can remember Riley Grace and Isaac embracing, Caroline crying over the grave after most everybody had left, and Grant and Cameron still in shock that this was actually happening. Overall, the ceremony was very awkward. Many people stepping around certain words, too afraid to admit certain facts. But I can understand why. Like everything else we'd endured over the past several weeks, we didn't know how else to react. In hindsight, I've come to realize that no matter how frequently I try to disregard how prominent a role I played in the events leading up to Elizabeth's disappearance, I am defenseless against the evidence that the events that transpired that night were the culmination of my own personal misconceptions. I was solely responsible for the near ruination of entire friendships because in my hysteria, I had been quick to label Isaac as a maniac, capable of doing real harm to those that he cared about. Yet in my oversight, I was unable to make the connection that Isaac, along with the rest of us, served only as a muse for a more insidious threat to masquerade as. We all served our own roles in perpetuating the situation. As we kept creating the scenarios for the entity to exist in our selfish quest for high adrenaline, or abandoning each other in the thickest of it all. This had stoked the flames of the creature that I had drafted in my mind, which only served to prolong its lifespan. This monster acquiring power, gaining notoriety, and all the while ever growing closer to us. Learning from us. I often find myself grasping at straws, struggling to fit the pieces together, trying to understand why someone would have put so much effort to assume our fabricated identity. But I nonetheless conclude it came down to coincidence. Whatever that man had planned to do to Maggie's family that first night, we had stopped it but we had also presented it a veil, a fad under which a dangerous threat could hide and continue his tirade and redirect his attention onto a defenseless group of insecure teenagers. As I can recall each instance he was within my sights without my knowledge. With this revelation came the unnerving possibility that this monster could have taken me as its prize at any time. But there still remains an inkling of doubt in my mind as to if I was ever its intended target. Once the beast caught sight of Elizabeth, there was nothing I could do to stop it from abducting the most virtuous and innocent of us, whom had likely become its most passionate fixation. And after the monster was appeased, it presumably moved on to somewhere else. The only thought that manages to ease my mind when the events invade my nightmares time after time is the possibility that I was not solely responsible for bringing this monster to light, that I merely served as a catalyst for an already present threat to emerge. Regardless, this reassurance still leaves me with a lingering feeling of unease. That man, the real Night Stalker, had managed to infiltrate my small circle of friends for weeks through a series of premeditated attacks without us noticing. I can't fully understand why this became his new mission, even though I know the end result. What was his full plan for a group of 16 and 17 year old kids from a small town? And why do I still feel a lingering unrest? as though it wasn't completed.